On the topic of X-Men, uh, X-Men 97, you know, I've been meaning to do some reviews of episodes um, 4, 5, and 6. 6 just came out. Um, you know, episode 4 I thought was good. I didn't think it was as... I think episode 3 so far has been the best episode. I think episode 5 was good, and I think it's a bit overrated. Um, and episode 6 was fine. X-Men 97 has been really good, provided they don't get preachy. When they get preachy, uh, it loses, I think, some of its, um, I don't know, just <clears throat> narrative flow, you know? Like, if, I mean, I understand that X-Men, um, has, you know, always been a vehicle for you know, like, it's kind of having this message of, you know, oppressed people, you know, and the, and that's the superheroes. The superheroes are the oppressed people, and that's, like, the difference between, like, you know, a Marvel comic and, like, a DC comic, you know, whereas, like, with the DC comic, you know, Superman is Superman and everybody loves him, whereas, like, the Marvel comics, it was more like the superheroes had problems and, you know, the X-Men were, you know, different and scary. And so, you know, they dealt with issues that, you know, people that are on the outside deal with. But, you know, it, you know, it's not been, at least in its heyday, um, something that is, like, I guess you could say woke in the sense of, you know, um, I guess having like an identity politics um, analysis with Marxist structures. And I don't mean, I don't think Marx is uh, a, a boogeyman word or anything like that. But when you apply Marx to identity politics, you strike at the heart of humanity and you divide people in an irreconcilable way often because, you know, if you're looking at people in terms of proletariat and bourgeoisie, you know, like, people can change their thinking or change their class allegiances, but if you're looking at things like black and white man and woman, and then you start, you know, putting these hard and fast rules of oppressed and oppressor there, you know, then it's like you're bad just for being born the wrong way, and you end up with a kind of a reverse discrimination happening, um, which is analogous to this idea of the dictatorship of the proletariat interpreted in the most crude and, um, uh, unconstructive way possible, uh, meaning like I get in charge and then I just fuck everyone over for my own benefit because, you know, after all, I'm better than you. So there's my little side rant about that. So, I mean, but where X-Men 97 has been really good is it's done an excellent job of diving into the comic books and adapting the comic books and distilling the comic book stories uh, in a way that works for a 30-minute cartoon. And they've been doing really well. And I think in some cases, they've, they've actually made the comic book characters better in the cartoon than in the actual comic books. Um, episode 4, um, you know, they had, I think it's pronounced like um, Absissa, the, the Jubilee um, from Mojo's, uh, dimension that, um, in the comic books, uh, I guess she served Mojo in exchange for, you know, not screwing with the universe. Um, and, you know, in the, and then she ends up dying because Jubilee won't take the offer again. And then that ends up somehow messing up her existence in the Wolverine comic books that she was in. But in the, um, the animated series, they had kind of like a cool explanation for her that she was a beta test of Jubilee that kind of gained sentience and was kind of working independent of what Jojo, or not Jojo, yeah, Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, Mojo wanted. And uh, I thought that was really cool. And it was a way to, you know, add extra interest and sympathy and character um, to a minor character that has kind of a dark story. And I mean, they did the same thing with Goblin Queen. Like, you know, if, you know, I remember like, I, I watched that episode and then I went back and I read 
the Inferno stuff. And they did a much better job in the cartoon, I think, of fleshing out, um, you know, Madeline Pryor as the Goblin Queen uh, during all that stuff. Um, so, and, you know, like, that, so that was really good. And that, then, if you go to episode five, set up um, some really cool stuff with Madeline Pryor and Cable. Um, like, the X-Men comic books now... You know, I've, I haven't really read them that much because I think they've gotten kind of, like, dumb. Um, and also, like, m they weren't selling very well and my comic book store was having issues with their distributor. Um, so all of that meant that, like, newer X-Men comics were, you know, fewer and farther between increasingly. And the new X-Men comic books that I ended up just buying all the time were the X-Men 92 comic books <laughs> where they didn't really screw with anything. But, you know, apparently, so like I, I watched episode five, which I thought was quite good. And there are some people that are saying it's like, oh, it's like the greatest episode Marvel animated thing ever. And it's not. Um, I, I mean, it's I prefer Pride of the X-Men, quite honestly, to episode five of X-Men 97, which is still very good. Um you know, it's called Remember It, and, um, so spoilers ahead here, so it looks like Gambit and Magneto die in that episode, and Gambit has this really cool way where he dies, actually, where, you know, um, so the, uh, like, I didn't read these parts, of I, I stopped reading at this point, but, and I'd heard about it, and it sounded dumb, is that the X-Men basically, you know, as the writers of X-Men shift, it became more radicalized by, by identity politics that affected their writing. So it was no more about Professor X um, and his idea of coexistence between humans and mutants. Professor X and the X-Men and all the mutants become basically mutant supremacists um, and have their own like mutant colony like fire island or something <laughs> and uh you know and that that's where they you know rule and and so that's the that's the place that they live it's called Krakoa and you know and then they just end up I don't know having orgies and acting in morally ambiguous ways and like it, some of it sounds interesting and a, and a lot of it is just garbled bullshit um, that just is, that just seems to ruin characters, um, iconic personas, um, just because the writers don't know what the fuck they're doing. Um, they're just, you know, doing whatever they want with no oversight, um, or little editorial oversight. I don't even know what's going on over there, but I, I, I quite, I mean, it sounds to me like Marvel just doesn't really care that much about the comic book end of, you know, Marvel <laughs> and, uh, they're more focused on the entertainment end. And so, you know, it's, that that's what's happened. You know, it's like there's a, a kind of a tribal political mentality um, within the American comic book industry. Uh, it's very much focused on uh, what would be considered the American left wing version of identity politics. Um, and so it's just off to the races with that. And it's not about humans and mutants coexisting. It's about mutants being better than humans and, you know, being and acting in morally ambiguous ways. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. That's the X-Men now. But anyway, um, like many things, the X-Men cartoon adapted uh, that stuff better than the comic books actually did. Um, and so, you know, Magneto, who's always had this goal of mutant supremacy, because Magneto was supposed to be like the Soviet Union, and Professor X was supposed to be like LBJ, right? That's, this is not about Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. That's not true. That's, if you read the original X-Men, that's not what the original X-Men was about. I have nothing against Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, but that's not what the original X-Men comic books were about. Everyone wants to say... That, oh, if you go back and read the 60s X-Men, you know, it's, it's all about the civil rights movement. It's not about the civil rights movement. It's about the Cold War. And it's so obvious. Magneto wears red. His name is Magneto. There's parts of Russia called Magnitogorsk, which are about, like, metal, that deals with, like, metallurgy and, you know, like... The Soviet Union was famous for its work with metal and steel, um, and it had this authoritarian, draconian, supremacist model for the working class. 
and you know that and it that was what it was and the brotherhood of evil mutants were like the war was like the warsaw pact in the in the communist bloc they were places that magneto had saved and now magneto was kind of controlling they were indebted to magneto but they were also being abused by magneto that's what the early x-men were like and then professor x and the x-men were like the united states version of things where there's allegedly coexistence, peaceful coexistence, or at least the goal of peaceful coexistence between, you know, the working class and the capitalist class, or, you know, whatever you can try to plug into that. But that's the idea is that we don't have this idea of supremacy in the United States. It's more about coexistence where, and that's good according to the U.S. way of thinking. And, you know, the Russian way of thinking was wrong, and that was the Cold War, and it was a Cold War comic, okay? Um, but as, you know, people became radicalized, you know, that now it looks a lot different. Now, I mean, as time progressed, they really fleshed out the characters, added a lot of humanity to Magneto, ultimately made him a good guy in the 80s, and even when he was a bad guy. And as you got into the thaw of the Cold War, the, the complexities of the Soviet Union and its purpose, you know, became more present in American portrayals of Russia. Um, so Magneto became a more complicated person. Um, so, you know, and he was always an interesting person uh, because he was a Holocaust survivor and he was very strong, even though he was old, you know. Um, but anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. But um, so, you know, they, they did this um, episode where there was this like, you know, Genosha was the like the mutant island and then it ends up getting attacked, and Magneto and Rogue were going to be their um, leaders, uh, and, you know, the Sentinel goes and, you know, blows up the Hellfire Gala, and um, Magneto basically, uh, you know, he tries, he saves the Morlocks, he saves Gambit and Rogue, and there's this interesting love triangle between Gambit and Rogue and Magneto, because Magneto, uh, I guess you know, and Rogue had a thing going, uh, back in Rogue's, you know, bad guy days, and Magneto's always kind of a, a gray area person, walking the line between a good guy and a bad guy, so Rogue found him interesting, uh, shocker, um, so, so they had a relationship, but, like, you know, Magneto still likes Gambit, and, you know, they don't have, they're not together anymore, so, like, you know, as a sentinel is, like, killing all these mutants, Magneto, like, chucks Rogue and Gambit into a corner and, like, kind of makes a metal cocoon for them while he's, like, trying to blast the sentinel and protect the Morlocks. It was a, a, actually a very, very cool scene. And then it looks like Magneto's dead. Um, and so then Rogue, like, flies into a rage and starts attack, trying to attack the sentinel, and then Gambit's, like, going to try to help her out and protect her. And, like, Gambit ends up getting impaled by the sentinel and you know, doing the smart move, he turns it into a kamikaze attack and just, like, dumps all of his uh, charge energy into this into the thing that's impaling him, and then it blows up the Sentinel and seemingly him with it. And it was a, a very, uh, it was a sad but a very cool scene. Um, so, you know, that's been, like, stuff like that has been, like, excellent in X-Men 97. And it really has, like, grown up with the audience. You know, if you watch the you know, 90s X-Men cartoon, it's also excellent, but it's clearly aimed at kids. You know, this X-Men cartoon has got kind of a, a little bit of a darker, more mature tone because the audience that, you know, watched the X-Men have, you know, kind of grown up. And so the tone is kind of matured with the audience. Um, the, the episode after that was about Storm and Forge, and it was fine. I mean, it wasn't like knock your socks off good or bad it was good it was just some weird demon owl and storm ended up back with her 80s costume for some reason which is fine you know it looked better than i i like mohawk storm and i love jim lee storm but the design that they did with storm where she was wearing her jim lee outfit with that mohawk looked really stupid and um so now she's just back to i guess she got her powers back and that automatically meant that she had her, like, eight, early 80s, late 70s costume with them, which is fine by me. I think that costume looks good. And I'd much rather have that costume than this weird hodgepodge of her mohawk and her and her white outfit, which I don't think looks good. Um, and Forge is cool. But, I mean, when they were talking about Forge, like, they started, like, throwing in this, like, 
anti-colonial stuff about Native Americans, and I was like, I guess, <laughs> like, I don't know, it's just, they're, like, they're, every once in a while, they'll, like, try to shoehorn something in, and it's like, this doesn't really fit, you know, like, I mean, I, I understand, the, like, Indians were screwed over, um, but, like, we don't, like, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess they were trying to do something along the lines of, like, Indians shouldn't try to be white and Storm shouldn't try not to be a mutant or something like that. But, I mean, if you study Native American history, there was all kinds of stuff where Native Americans, like, they tried to be militantly Indian and just kill white people and that didn't work. And then they tried to assimilate and be like white people and that didn't work. And sometimes they were forced to be like white people and that didn't work. And I mean, and, some, and then a lot of Indians wanted to kind of mix and max and, and hodgepodge and that's basically what ended up happening. Um, but like, I don't know. I mean, it just, when, when you're ham-fistedly preachy, it just comes off as like, it just comes off as unnatural and unnecessary. Um, but it wasn't, like, that bad. And I, and I like Native Americans, and I like Native American history, and I like Forge, and I think he's cool, so, you know, it's all good. Um, they are going, they're doing the thing with Professor X and Lilandra and his, like, exoskeleton suit that lets him walk. Um, it sounds in the comic books that they're doing, like, really stupid stuff where, um... I don't know, Professor X is like a kind of a mealy mouth, bad guy, good guy, I don't know. And Cyclops is just yelling at him. They're trying to make Cyclops like militant in X-Men 97, which is dumb. Because like, I mean, I know in the comic books that happens to him, but I don't think that's a good look for Cyclops. Like Cyclops is much more the, yes sir, you know. Like, and that can be very annoying, but just turning him into some, like, I don't know, like some, uh, re in, you know, some kind of, you know, reverse racist inversion of that is kind of dumb. I, like, I mean, the first thing that caught me was, like, in the first episode, he was, like, calling the, um, the, the anti-mutant racists, like, scum, you know, which is not a cycle. I mean, like, the, the Friends of Humanity are, are bad guys. There's no question about it. Oh, hey, Yes is on here. Cool. Um, I wish I read more X-Men comics to comment on this. Oh, well, that's cool, you know. We'll just, just listen. <laughs> you know? um, so, like, yeah, if you, like, the 80s, 90s Cyclops that I grew up with, at least, you know, was always, like, let's follow Professor X's path, you know, which is there's bad humans, but they're misled, and we should help and educate them. We can fight them if they're hurting, if they're attacking us in self-defense, but it's not like they're scum and we're good, right? And, but, like, the first thing is, like, that's what he does, you know? Um, and then there was that whole thing with um, the Executioner, who, I, I, I had forgotten he was a comic book character. I actually have the comic book that he debuted, and it was this very weird angular issue with, like, Storm and Colossus. And uh, when I first was watching the cartoon, it's like, I think I remember this guy. And then I'm like, nah, maybe I don't. I think they just made him up. And then I looked back into it and they're like, oh yeah, I do. I, this guy was in the comic books. And by the way, I actually did have a com the comic book where he kind of you know debuted. Um, all I read was that five issue uh, Wolverine comic. Well, Wolverine is the best X-Men. And this, I'm sure they'll probably address this at some point, but um, there hasn't been enough Wolverine in X-Men 97. Um, and I understand people will be like, this isn't the Wolverine show, it's the X-Men. It's like, yeah, well, that may be, but Wolverine's the best. Um, and, like, this isn't up for debate. Wolverine is the best X-Men. <laughs> he's a badass. He's, he's complicated. Um, and he's, he's like this walking contradiction, uh, that's like, he's got unrequited love, but he's the ultimate fighting machine. He's small, but he's got this indestructible skeleton. He, you know, he can't really age. Um, he's like kind of perpetually like 40, in his late 40s and grizzled. Um, and he's just, he's like Don Johnson crossed with a gruff Canadian hockey player that happens to be a uh, incredibly skilled martial artist 
with indestructible claws and healing factor um and like uh you know uh, amnesia trauma you know <laughs> and he's in love with Jean Grey you know the kind of the girl next door and uh but he knows like he can't have her I mean it's like it's re he's really cool and his costume looks cool his look is cool you know so I mean I I do understand kind of the need to have him like not necessarily be front and center all the time, but I, this they need to get get some Wolverine going here because I mean each episode I think the first two episodes I didn't think were good. Everything after the first two episodes I think have been very good, um, uh, to excellent.